The best innovations we have have been created by studying the world around us. For example, the first needles were created by inspecting mosquitoes. Velcro was inspired by what we learned from investigating the burdock plant, and sonar was directly inspired by dolphins. We human beings often pride ourselves for being creative, but as King Solomon once said, there's nothing new under the sun. In other words, we're not really that creative. At best, we're just skilled at observing that which God has created and replicating it. So, we're not as unique as we think we are. When playing things like video games, we tend to expect things to look, work, and feel in the game world the way they do in the real world around us. If you want to make art that's appealing and attractive, you really need to study how your art affects people because we instinctively know what looks good, what works, and what doesn't. Of course, there's a moving scale for our tolerance, but if there's one thing we truly want out of a world to explore, it's consistency. We as human beings need the rules of our world to be consistent across the board. Otherwise, it's chaos. We not only want consistency, we want variety in our consistency. I know that sounds quite contradictory, but if everything looked exactly the same, we'd get lost easily and quickly become frustrated. Nobody wants to get lost in the woods. Instead, we want little road markers to help remind us where we are so that we can navigate where we want to be. So it doesn't mean that our world should look the same all over. What it does mean is that if our world is going to be something players will want to explore, we're going to have to find a way to introduce new areas that still abide by the same set of rules. The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past tackled this concept exceptionally well. There were several unique areas in the game, each with a degree of variance, but it was still able to hold to a standard set of rules across the board. Zelda followed unwritten guidelines, like considering the scale. Tree stumps, for example, needed to be scaled correctly not only to the player and other game objects in the world, but it had to be scaled correctly to other stumps in other areas. Then we had to consider things like proportion, where scale is the size of objects according to the other objects around it, Proportion is the size of things according to itself. Proportion can be tricky in video games because in many games the proportions can be intentionally designed to be disproportional. But if this is the case, the designers create a new rule about proportion and it's the same rule that they use across the board. Then we also have to consider things like color palette. When using a color palette, I would strongly encourage you to keep the colors you use in the same color family. When coloring shadows or highlights on objects, only select lighter or darker colors in the same color family. But also our art style needs to be consistent. Don't use pixel art in one place and vector art in another. If you're gonna make your game black and white, make it consistent across the entire world. If it has a dark theme, give everything that same effect. If it's cartoonish, make it cartoonish everywhere. But we also need to consider things like game mechanics. In The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, the terrain was consistent in the general rules. Things like movement speed, enemies, and things you could walk through, things you couldn't. But it also tied many of these mechanics to game items that you picked up as you progressed through the game. And to give these mechanics even greater importance, the creators not only tied many of these mechanics to game objects themselves, but they designed whole dungeons and areas around them. Now we can do this by creating a set of rules in the starting area. But then let's say we introduce a desert area. You would of course need to create some kind of desert location using alternative colors in the same color palette and use the same art style. But then we could take all the previous mechanics from the first area, which is a simple or no mechanic theme, and introduce a new mechanic. For example, the player could walk at 80% speed when he's in the sand. Or on the ice, for example, we could make it take longer to get moving and slide when the player stops pressing in a direction. Or in a cave, you could take away the light and introduce the lantern and put emphasis on the light. There are a lot of unwritten rules in world building, and to be completely honest, I've really only scratched the surface. And if you're thinking to yourself, wow, you really know a lot about art. Well, you should know that's because I married an art major. <laughs> Needless to say, creating art that is appealing is a complicated subject. So for now, I'm just going to go into the overview of how I designed the starting area for my game, and as we move further into this series, I'll design new locations for Tom to explore using new mechanics. I actually struggled quite a bit with creating tile palettes that fit my needs. I would say this is one thing I knew to practice right away. The character, NPCs, and enemies need to be on a separate but similar color palette so that they don't blend in with the world. We want them to stand out and pop. I spent a lot of time creating art, 
and I ended up throwing it away, but I knew that was to be expected. I actually arrived at what I was happy with by watching a devlog that I really recommend that you check out if you haven't already done so. It's done by a guy named Game Endeavor. This guy is great. He's got a wealth of information on his channel, and trust me when I say it is well worth your time. And this is where I probably need to give a little disclaimer. I replicated a lot of this guy's art by carefully watching his channel and following the same steps he described. And you might be saying to yourself, well that's not right, you should design and use your own art. And if this is how you feel, I'd just like to say, first of all, I replicated the art by watching his channel and drawing something similar. I did not download something that he created, so I did use my own art because I put in the work. Second, remember how we've been talking about how there's nothing new under the sun? And third, if it really troubles you that I would take something that someone else made and replicate it or draw inspiration from it, I would ask you to consider what you're doing here watching this video. I follow Game Endeavor's advice in multiple ways. For example, he uses pixel art that is in 24 by 24 squares instead of the typical 16 by 16 because it's easier to get more definition and 32 by 32 just seems like a little bit too much work. For the moment, I'm only running with four layers on the tile map. For example, the dirt and grass layer, which is just a few tiles at the moment, but this will grow exponentially as we create new areas. I have a bushes and walls layer, which is incredible how many of these you actually need to do simple things like rounding corners. I have a treetops layer, which is just black, but it looks great in my opinion. Then I have a shadows layer, which is the same art that I use for the treetops, but its opacity is turned to 70%. Game Endeavor showed how he used a parallax effect on shadows and treetops, and I liked this effect, so I replicated it. For the buildings, I replicated pixel art structures that I found on Pinterest, always keeping in mind that I needed to keep the scale of these objects relatively close to each other. For things like trees, I'll be completely honest, I really struggled in this area. So, in the end, I had to call my wife in to make these for me. Like I said, she's an art major. Gentlemen, if you're planning to marry someday, the best advice I can give you is this. Marry someone who is smarter, more talented, and out of your league so she can help you when you get into a pickle. <laughs> Going back to The Legend of Zelda a Link to the Past, I really liked how you could transition from one part of the map to the next. And this is something I can easily create using Cinemachine. Going inside from outside, however, is something I also took from The Legend of Zelda a Link to the Past. Here you're actually seeing a shader effect I made using a sprite called a dither. In Zelda, specific areas you entered around the world would either fade to black or fade back in or could use like a circle in effect. There's something else I should mention on this effect. I placed the interior to my building in a separate location and when the dither effect is happening, I actually relocate my player to that location. And there's one more thing that I would mention in this devlog that I found critical in the game objects and how they related to my player in the world. And that's, of course, the sorting layers in respect to moving your player. For example, when you move the player to a specific location, you want him to move behind a tree or behind a rock whenever you move beyond a certain point. If you're completely unaware on how to do this, I'll go ahead and tell you now that it depends greatly on the pivot point that's located on your player and your game objects. There is one thing that I have yet to figure out, however, and it's something I've done a lot of research on and experimentation trying to fix. It's the stupid little green lines that pop up when you move due to the tile palette and the 2D renderer. I've read in places this has a lot to do with the sprites that you use and the materials that you place on them. And hopefully this is where you come in. If you know how to fix these stupid green lines, would you let me know in the comment section? If you can fix my problem, I will find a way to kiss your face. There is a great big world that still needs to be created for Tom. One with enemies, NPCs, quests, dungeons, and combat, and I'm really looking forward to creating it. If you enjoy these videos and you've learned something, maybe you'd consider supporting me on Patreon. Just head on over and choose your level of support, and you could gain access to my private Discord server where I'd be happy to answer any questions on any of my builds. You can take part in online polls. You could gain early access to YouTube content that I put out. You can get a shout out in one of my videos or even download the project files for my complete inventory system and my complete 2D player controller. Speaking of shout outs, I want to once again thank Yoon Sungi for his generous support. You are a rock star, bro. Anyway, that's it for this video. I'm really looking forward to getting into the combat system I've created, but for now, just let me say thank you for joining me. My name is Megahertz, and I'm out.